And uh, at this point, we know we've got interest on the East Coast and a little bit that's international as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, go figure. Uh, we we're talking. So you, sir, are Don. Introduce yourself, <laughs> or do you want me to introduce you? Uh, well, my name is Don Scoby. This is Tom Trimbeth. Uh, this is <laughs> you. You have made it to uh, self-publishing from inspiration to publication, and we're looking to give uh, give folks information as to what can be done, and hopefully give you at least an initial boot bootstrap into how you can self-publish your own book. Um, Tom has published 11 books. As he just said, he has one on the way. I, uh, <laughs> I last, time, uh, last time we did this was October, and about two weeks later, I ended up getting my first book published. I was, like Tom, hoping to have that here, but it wasn't quite done. Um, and then uh, I was able to follow up about a month later and get that done as an ebook. However, I have been self-publishing for a while also as a musician, doing CDs, which is just to illustrate that there's more self-publishing going on these days than there was about 20 years ago. So uh, as said, we got to do this back in October. We're very glad to bring this back here to the Langley Library again this month. And we're hoping to, what well, we're talking about being in Freeland at the end of the year, they're uh, looking to hold a series for authors that will actually go from the end of 2019 into 2020. So keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out for us with that too. Um, we're also talking to Coopville for some time this summer and then also Oak Harbor. Uh, when we did this back in October, uh, about two weeks before we came up to this, Tom and I, Tom and I uh, share a sense of humor, which um, goes a long way. <laughs> but uh, online at one point, Tom ended up, and this is, this is verbatim what we had online, Tom ended up uh, saying, two weeks, huh? This was two weeks out. He says, two weeks, huh? I wonder what we'll say. <laughs> and I came back and said, something, something, humorous thing, blah, 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 unintended humorous thing, blah, blah, some more. And that's how you self-publish your book. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much said it all there. Right? right? And really, <laughs> if you don't have a sense of humor going into this. Uh, oh, dear. <laughs> well, if you don't have a sense of humor, hopefully you have a liquor cabinet. Um, <laughs> Or a big bag of coffee. Who knows what's in this? Yes. Yeah, that, that from the guy that doesn't drink. Um, <laughs> uh, more recently uh, on Twitter, we turned around and, and uh, what that was yesterday, uh, we talked about uh, Tom's book and we started doing this as see Tom, see Tom's book, see Tom's cell book, see Tom. You know, <laughs> we figured that we were going to have our own, uh, uh, what is that, the Dick and Jean? Oh, yeah, series. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we thought we were going to have a whole book written by tonight. So. <laughs> Not quite, but yeah. <laughs> but you know, to me, it's one of the things that, that uh, I find fascinating about being a writer on, on Libby is uh, one of the greatest tools we've got to keep us going is each other. You know, you know, we're talking about, you know, he's just published his first book. I've been published, self-publishing for almost, well, 17 years now. But uh, that is just a small slice of the experience that's on this island. I mean, you're going story smash, right? I get that right? Mm -hmm. You know, the number of folks around here that have experience is just amazing. Um, so what we're hoping to do is to talk about how this industry has been coming along. Uh, so I've kind of got that part of the story. He's got the most up-to-date story uh, with having just published his book, which I hope well, I'll have new experience as soon as I publish my next one, which was going to be done today, like we said, and it should be done next week. Uh, there's a software issue and that sort of thing happens, but... Anyway. Well, and that was partly because you're doing a photo book and using one of the many companies that are available for doing self-publishing, but you needed something different than some of the other more mainstream things like Amazon. Yeah. So the other thing that we're pointing this out, and I've, I've done this, uh, I've done this lecture, presentation, workshops, classes, and whatnot for over a decade, and it always changes. It changed from when he just did his in the fall to what's happening now. And it changed since six years ago when I met you yeah. in this workshop. So for instance, what I'm trying to do, could you hold up one of the hard, hard, pound, hardback books that I got? Okay, whatever you so want to call it. So today what I was gonna be showing was 12 months at Max Walton Beach, because I do 12 month photo essays. Go to a place 12 months out of the year, take pictures, cut up. The software from those books has changed to the point that all the saved templates, all the saved work, all the saved text, all the saved layouts, totally invalid. We just found that out this afternoon. It ideally could have been done 
in two hours. And now we're finding we have to start from scratch with brand new software, reformat everything, and get it all done. Is that because Kindle and Create Space? No, this is. Uh, believe it or not, there are other companies beside Kindle and Create Space. I know that. Yep. I know. <laughs> <laughs> this one's the expensive one, which is supposed to work smoother. Oh. Which one is it? <laughs> which one is it? Or what about InDesign? Uh, we're going to have to use InDesign to feed the proprietary software for that book to be able to create. A very simple book, uh, but yeah, Joe Menth. For those of you who are familiar, Joe Menth is uh, I'm hiring Joe Menth to do that part of the work because I don't have an InDesign license and I don't have to pay for one. But that's kind of getting into a detail at this point. What um, was the thing you said, Mur? What? Blurb. Oh, blurb. Blurb. Mm -hmm. Isn't that just a really professional sounding name? <laughs> <laughs> Blurb dot com. Very pretty books that are hard to sell at a profit, <laughs> but they're very pretty books. <laughs> But there's a lot of companies out there too. It's not just one reference. So we'll, yeah, we'll yeah. kind of get into that sort of thing as well. Get into the elements of the book and the elements of the publishers and whatnot. But uh, did you want to tell more of the story of the cookbook that almost didn't happen as the computer ate it? Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually, uh, earlier before we got started, I was talking with Paul, and uh, haven't seen him since I moved from the south end of the island to the north end of the island last year. And uh, one of the things that I was able to connect with him about was the book's done. The book got done. Um, as said, we, we did this, I think it was October 12th or so, and I ended up publishing October 28, 29, something like that. Um, but part of the backstory to that, um, and I think you were asking if I brought any cookies. <laughs> um, I, not that you would know it, but I'm the owner of Woodby Island Baking Company. Um, which I delivered <laughs> on the island here. Um, in fact, I also, uh, one of my main carriers is the uh, cafe across the street. Um, anyway, uh, I decided uh, about three, well, three years ago this month, it came to fruition that there's plenty of work to do in the food business. There's not necessarily quite enough money in the food business. So I had to look and say, where does my passion really lie within what I'm doing? And I got back to that. I like to create recipes. I like to connect with people over good food. I like to to see people grow within their own experiences in the kitchen. So how can I do that, keeping my thumb into my business, but leave that production baking sort of thing? And I said, write a book, write a book. So I got going with that actually before I stopped uh, stopped production. And uh, I actually delivered my last cookie on March 29th, three years ago. And then I found something that's really bad for writing a book, which April 1st, I got into a car accident and got whiplash. And if you're sitting like this, whiplash bad. So uh, something I learned as a writer, just a little tip, don't get whiplash. Um, <laughs> so there's that. What I also learned was back up your hard drive. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> I, at one time, I think it was, I think it was about a, the uh, December following. Yep. Uh, <laughs> shutting down my company. So basically I was sitting around for a year because I wasn't really good for much there with Whiplash. Um, I just about had the book done. I figured I was about 80 hours away. And um, my computer just said, oh, no. And it was it was a hard drive crash that gone. Fortunately, I actually did have a backup and had a fair amount of my work, but I also had to redo a lot of the work. So something, something that I would also encourage is have multiple backups, have automatic backups, cloud backups, whatever, whatever works for you, but at least have one regular backup system. And so also have somebody you can commiserate with. You get on the phone and go, <laughs> you won't believe what just happened. Yeah, I think you were, uh, aside from my computer guru friends, I think you were phone call number three. So... <laughs> But uh, yeah, so we rattle off how many different ways you can now back up a computer. <laughs> I just hit a few. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but but in all sincerity, that is uh, one of the greatest hazards. He's not the only one. I've uh, I consult with various folks doing things like this, and sure enough, I've had folks call up and just say, you know, I hit delete. I'd actually select it all, got the entire manuscript. Oh. Oh. Accidentally hit delete, oh. and then went Control into DOS. And, yeah, went went into mm -hmm. DOS, hit F disk just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I thought it was going to be as simple as you say, you know, control just just undo. 
Uh, no, she had actually found a way to just, it went. Luckily, her husband was an IT professional to the point that she didn't want to talk to him about computers because he always knew exactly what to do. <laughs> In this case, it was handy because he was able to go into the hard drive and actually recover oh. the thing. But it took him, it still took him the better part of a day. Yeah, so uh, don't hold shift as you hit the So, uh, I, oh, if I may, I'm writing, I'm writing four books right now. So is this six, 12 art, art, there aren't enough already. Um, <laughs> I'll have a copy on my Chromebook. I'll have a copy on a thumb drive. I'll have a copy up online. And I'll have another copy on an external hard drive. Because those words are hard to get back. Mm -hmm. Ironically, the best way to archive interim work, or actually any work, is to print it on paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's something that I, as, as soon as I had the hard drive crashed, because I did have some print, but I said, gee, if I had a stack of papers here from a week ago, 70 words a minute, I could recreate it. Well, not only that, you throw it into a, a, a scanner, and it'll retype the whole thing. Oh, and... well, if you're modern. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I digress from what you're saying. <laughs> so uh, it was, what, you got that out? this year october which was the right timing for ah yeah some of the uh some of the best time for marketing your book is uh christmas which when does christmas start october october <laughs> september <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the first phase there that's the people that are organized i don't know any of these people because I, I can't seem to quite align with them um the people that actually do their shopping early for christmas is starts in september september october the next time that you want to shoot for for having your book out if you missed that September October sort of window is Black Friday and then the time that you want uh, to next be ready and I, I think there's kind of two in a way well it's two different ways of looking at it you want to be ready for uh, the day of or the day after Christmas which is when people are using their little gift credit cards so one of the other ways that you want to be you know they've, they've unwrapped the presents they're still sitting around in their PJs and eating candy and and eggnog and all that, and they're online ordering with that card. So at that point, they can order your book. But what you also would like to do is have them be able to order your ebook. So you can reformat your your book, assuming you're working in something like Word, for what you want for an ebook, and get that ready. I was I was actually able to get mine ready. I think it was about in two weeks, and I wanted Tom to take a look at it. He was just busy at the time. So I sent it to him and he wasn't able to look at it for a week or two, but so it took a month, but it really only took me two weeks to change my book to an ebook. So, so let me just kind of phrase that then in terms of history, you know, that is the sort of thing that, and I, yeah, I was busy. You were. <laughs> There's a whole other story where I was, what I was doing for that week, but we're not going to get into that. I can talk about that in the next talk, which is on real estate. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there's an example. You know, he put this book together. He lost it. He was able to bring it back again. And then not only bring it back, but also come up with another edition within a month. Okay, I'm going to go and take this back to 2002 when I did my first book, which is the big blue one. Ah. Which is this guy, Just Keep Peddling. I wasn't trying to become a writer. It's right beside me. I knew that copy was somewhere. But the, I wrote this one. By accident, I was just writing a bunch of emails talking about my bicycle trip across the United States so that folks knew where I was, so they knew what was going on. I got home and some friends said, you've got more notes in here than most folks have when they're writing a book. Like, look. When I wrote this, and I did pitch it to traditional publishers, and they all turned it down, of course, um, because that's the, mad, that's the nature of writing, right? The, the industry was so new that there were only 13,000 print-on-demand titles that year, 2002. Three years ago, there were 750,000. Now, we're on demand. So that's what I was about to get to. Thank you that's, so much. That's what we're here for. <laughs> you are so good. Come on, thank you. <laughs> so prior to uh, computers, there was this idea that you had this to... This is the tablet that you chipped away at? Pretty much. Right. I can take it back that far if you want, but that's in the longer <laughs> version of this talk. But prior to that, it was the classic case, if you wanted to self-publish your book, you had to write the book, hire the editor or be the editor, hire a cover designer or be the cover designer, 
you had to build all this, and then you had to go pay somebody to run off a few thousand mm -hmm. copies of the book, usually like two or three thousand copies. If that's costing you five dollars a book, you're looking at ten, fifteen thousand dollars, and you've got two or three thousand copies you have to deal with. That was prohibitive, but that's where an awful lot of the stigma came across with self-publishing because, folks, it's a vanity thing, and you're putting out all this money to do this, whatever, whether it's vanity or if it's the fact that folks actually just wanted to get their word out regardless of what the editor said. So come around to 2002, and if you recall dot matrix printers, okay, just after dot matrix printers and laser print, uh, inkjet printers came out, they finally <clears throat> caught on. Have fun. It'll catch up. Yeah, so I'm okay. keeping myself busy. They'll finally they finally caught on to the fact that if you have a high speed laser or inkjet printer, people are printing out reams of paper at home. Why not print out reams of paper and turn it into a book? They had gotten to the point where the paper quality, the ink quality, the cover quality were all sufficiently comparable to the standard that was coming off the big presses that they could then sell a machine that a publisher would then buy, basically really a printer. And it was about as long as those bookcases over there. So for a hundred some odd thousand dollars, somebody could be printing books. And you didn't have to go spend thousands. You didn't have to buy thousands of copies of your book because it's an inkjet printer. You put in a file at this end and the book comes out at this end. <clears throat> and whether it's one book or a thousand books, it doesn't change the fact that that basic equipment is not going to change. And they started establishing businesses at that point where you had a machine that was that big that did the interior, which was all just going to be black and white. And then they had another machine that was about the size of a dishwasher that would print the cover. And then they had another machine that was right beside it that had the glue. And you had a person that picked up the thing, and they picked up the thing, and they put the thing with the glue, and all of a sudden you've got a book. So the, cop, the, the price of doing this had gone from tens or you know, $15,000 down to, when I did this, 500 to 1,000. That was a dramatic drop. This gets a stigma like nothing else. Go wrong for about five, six, seven years. And what then starts to happen is that the major publishers who have always downplayed all these other ways of publishing books start going, this stuff's great. Because we only have to print as many as we need. We don't have to have 3,000 copies of a book that don't sell sitting in a warehouse somewhere. They can drop their price, their cost, in total by just saying, give us your file, we'll print your book. And we won't print that book until somebody goes on to Amazon and clicks buy this book. So all of a sudden, the cost of the author goes down, the cost of the business goes down, the business risk goes down, and the number of titles that they can put out in a year goes up. About that time, Amazon goes, this is good, because half of Amazon's profits were coming from small run books. They thought it was all going to be from the major run books, but it's actually from the small run books where they're getting half their profits. So then Amazon buys CreateSpace. And Kindle's out there going, hey, if you're putting the electronic file in this end of the machine and sending out paper at the other end and selling it, you know, we could probably sell the electronic file you put into the end of the machine. And then the costs go down even more, the profit goes up even more, and then you have the Kindle revolution. And then within the last two years, Amazon goes, well, you know, we like Kindle's name better than CreateSpace, so Kindle, you now run CreateSpace, and they all work under Amazon. And you can now publish, instead of this one costing me a thousand, which is like, I just realized I got the stack over here I should use. Okay. Which of course doesn't have the one book I was going to reach for. Let's got one more. <laughs> just tell me. Over. There we go. I know. <laughs> this one, which I wrote uh, nine years ago, I walked across Scotland. Walking, thinking, drinking across Scotland, which probably sells because of the title has drinking in it. <laughs> uh, this cost me $35 to publish. And instead of waiting, months for rejection letters or weeks for a review from a publisher it was ready in 24 hours 35 dollars 35 dollars and one that copy? no 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 not at all to that was that was to get the book on amazon i could have done it for free 
but the $35 gave me access to a contract with a worldwide distributor. So that's where the $35 came from. You can now publish a book for free. Now, quality and you get what you pay for and all that sort of thing. But still, they've lowered the bar that far. We've gone within 20 years, we've gone from $15,000 to zero. That's the upside. The downside is the same sort of problems that you had when you were having traditionally self-publish a book because you still have to edit. You still have to get the graphics put together. You still have to get a cover design. You still have to do all these things. And of course, the biggest thing that traditional publishers used to do, but they don't even do much now, but it was really all on yourself, is to sell it. And that's the biggest sticky point. Um, the uh, the other thing that's enabled that, though, within the last five to ten years has been social media. And that's why not only does the cost of publication come down, but the cost of selling the book has come down. So I can put this book up on Amazon for, like I say, 35 bucks. It happens to sell well in Italy and France because I think they're making fun of Scots and Yanks. And uh, I don't have to handle any inventory. I have enough inventory to hang around so that if somebody walks up and says, hey, I wanted to buy your book and I want an autographed copy. I have some copies. I sign it. Here you go. It's in the back of the truck. It's also available for sale tonight. What's um, your initial number of books printed? As one. many as you want. No, 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 no. But it's on demand. <clears throat> one. So you just do the one. I'll do the yeah. Depending on the book, I will do one. Or I will do about 40. No, you're talking about was this uh, press to print or click print to print? On, print on demand. Print on demand. Okay. Yeah, which is a fancy word for an ink tipper. So basically, you don't have any uh, inventory. They do. Yes. They exactly. don't have any inventory. Oh, well, well, yeah, yeah. They just nothing. have a file that they print. Yeah. Ba print. Basically, it's it's much the same as your home computer attached to a printer. When you click print, something prints. If you say print two, it prints two. Right. So they have mm -hmm. a machine that's waiting there until you say, I want my photography book printed and I want five copies. Okay, the machine goes one, two, three, four, five. Somebody sticks it in a box, mails it to you. She says, I want my kayaking book printed and I need 30 copies. The machine spits out 30 copies. Some Amazon person sticks it in a box, hopefully nicely, and she gets those mailed to her. So you can get one, three, five, you know, as long, any number you want. But how much does it cost you for each one? Um, it depends a little bit on how many you what? order because you get a bit of a discount for shipping sort of thing. You, you get a bit of a cut down for volume. Um, there's also there's two answers to those questions, so right. I'll give you the other one. <laughs> um, depending, because I ordered 100 books initially, and then more recently, because over the, the holidays there with a couple of presentations, I sold about 30 books. I'm also big on acknowledging the people that, that help you bring things to fruition. So I also gave away 20 books to people that, that helped me with my book that were absolutely giving me a gift. You know, thank you, gratitude. So I gave away 20 copies. So these, depending on what it is, they cost me just below five bucks to almost six bucks, depending on the size order. Because I ordered 50 more, they cost me about a dollar more a copy. And so that's the other, that's the other you also. <laughs> earning money on each one that's sold. Well, hang on. Let me, let me do the other half first. If you go click on one of my books and you buy it off Amazon, it doesn't cost me anything. There's no cost to me associated whatsoever. It's going to say... So if you were the buyer... 1583 for 1585 They change the prices on you. Amazon can change the price all they want, so you always have to look. You pay fifteen eighty five plus shipping and handling. That's maybe customer. zero if it's prime. Amazon takes a cut. What percentage? Depends on what price I set on the book, and then I get the rest. So I can have up to thirty to seventy percent profit margin on my books, as compared to in traditional publishing, which was three to five. So, if I decide to order a bunch of books, it's going to cost me about five dollars a book. <laughs> and then I can sell them, and I've had to pay shipping and handling, and I have to worry about inventory damage, and I have to worry about you know, getting into people and things like that. Or I can just rely on online sales. And with online sales, it's passive income. I don't, 
I don't have to see whether anybody bought a book. I don't have to see whether or not they got it delivered. They hit the button. They get the, the book, and I get some of the money eventually. You don't get it right away. <laughs> matter of fact, uh, we've got the uh, – just to put the uh, – uh, well, let's see about – this is a really big royalty check. Thirty-four dollars. <laughs> that's from books that uh, I haven't. That's from books that are all at least seven years old. So uh, book sales go down the longer a book's been out there. Uh, Don. Is the cover a one-time expense for you? Is that a part of the overhead that you have to contribute before you get online? Uh, since I designed, I designed, uh, I designed this cover, so it didn't cost me anything. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, now, folks who hire me to design their covers, it costs something. <laughs> Say what? I well, think you have a great talent, then, if that's the case. Well, and this is the thing: there are. Dozens of skills involved in writing a book. You know, the hardest thing is to write the book. That's that's a heck of a thing to do. And I always say that's worth you know champagne right there or chocolate or whatever if you know. But let me see. What, I was just showing this to Don earlier. Come on, here we go. I was thinking rare state with lines. Okay, that works. Yeah. These are all the steps, and I could get on computer, but not. Shuffling paper is still faster than getting on a computer. These are all the steps it takes for me to buy, to make and sell my book. Line one is write the book. All these other lines are all the other things that have to get done. And it is ridiculous for an author to expect that they have all of those skills. So if you want the highest quality product, then you hire somebody who can format it. You hire somebody who can do the cover. You hire somebody who's going to edit it. But we all have some of those skills, and that's one way to keep the costs down. And it's also keep in mind what your expectations are. If you're expecting a book to have the potential to be a New York Times bestseller, I know folks that have spent $8,000 on all those services. If, on the other hand, uh, like some of the folks I've worked with, they have a passion for a message that they've got, whether it's for an advocacy group or a, a support group for a certain uh, illness or something like that. They don't care about how much they're making, and folks aren't expecting uh, a John Grisham kind of book. What they hunt for, they're hunting for information. How can I alleviate this pain? And they don't care how glossy the paper is. Uh, so it depends on what you're trying to do as to how much it's going to cost. It depends on how much you can do as to how much it's going to cost you. And it also depends on you know who you're going to be uh, selling it to or giving it to, as the case may be. Did I go here and answer? Pretty much. Cool. We'll go with pretty much. Okay. See there? Okay, there we go. That's the way I go with my books. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Are you going to hand out copies of that? For the Lola? Oh. Uh, no, but I'll, I'll send you a link to it online. Because... Uh, so you keep giving me the good liners. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd it go? Here we go. Yes, I could. This stuff, the self-publishing works reasonably well, cheaply enough, that the difference in cost of printing out an 8 by 10 or 8 and a half by 11 stapled set of papers to hand out at an event like this is only slightly less than printing it into a book that has a cover, has a spine, has the sort of thing that you can put on a bookshelf. And if you think about teaching classes and you hand out a bunch of handouts, handouts tend to go straight into recycle. But you give people a book, and there are people that don't want to write in a book because we have that taboo about writing in a book or dog-earing a page or things like that. But all of a sudden, you've given them something which has a little bit more gravitas to it. How about the page then? This is why I don't throw publish it anymore. <clears throat> the publishing industry has been changing so quickly that I could I was having to come up with a new version every six months. And every time I did, I had to come up with a new ISBN number. Yeah. Oh, and there you go. <laughs> it became onerous to have the book available online because it was so hard to keep it up to date. 
a website is a better way to do this. You also have to copyright it, don't you? Uh, yeah, we copyright these. Uh, copyright uh, can be such a convoluted thing that I'm, we can, I, I gave a, we gave a, a weekend presentation one time where we spent two full hours just talking about the various ways we can say, I don't know about copyright. But in the United States, if you are writing notes tonight, there are folks who would argue that as soon as you've written it, that is copyrighted. It is. And then if you want to up the level, put your name on it, date it, put the symbol on it, all that sort of thing. And then to the very end, you, if you want to register it with the Library of Congress, that costs like a total of $40. Each image. Which is why it's so much easier to do for a book. book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, the actual legal terminology is the copyright subsist, as you be S-I-S-T, the moment you take the picture. There you go. And in fact, the camera here puts it into the metadata. So, me. and as an example, that's one reason why, because I make the choice as I'm self-publishing. Yeah, feel free to swap it out. If you want to. Um, because I make the choices when I'm self-publishing, I draw the line, and I'm conscious of where I draw the line. I will copyright my books. I won't copyright my photo books for the very reason that at some point you come across a roadblock, and it's like, oh, you've got to be kidding. And there are enough things in this world that when you run across those things, they can really stymie you. Here's a case where I can kind of go, the quality of my life is more important than the quality of this book. And I just proceed on. Um, as one of my writer friends put it, if you only spent more time in your craft, you'd be doing so much better. Yeah, you're right. And, but I'm making choices in my life that I'm not devoting my life to writing. I'm not devoting my life to photography. But I also know that there are things that I want to say that I think others want to read. And that's why I still do what I do and do it to the extent that I do. What do you mean when you say you come across a roadblock? Well, for instance, it used to be that getting a book published was a roadblock because you had to go get an agent who would then get it to the editor, who would then get it past marketing, who would then get it to publish. And now this gets around all that. Which, That's which is one of the things that that I'm big on coming from doing CDs, you know, doing books, is I mean, take for either of these CDs. Um, this is Highland Bagpipe and Drum Kit. To go to you know, Sony or who have you and say, hey, don't you want to make this CD and sell it? They're going to say no. That's too weird. <laughs> you know, you're not Britney Spears. Um, you're not Mick Jagger, fortunately. Um, but, you know, in this case, you I can want look to be at, immortal? <laughs> uh, that's one of the other sons. Uh, <laughs> that's Keith Richards. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the thing is, is I believe in this. I believe in this and I'm willing to go out and stump for it. And I've seen other people that, you know, I can take my band out and play and swarm of people, but can I, you know, can I get a, a, a CD publisher to, to, to look at it and go, you know, Oh, well, I'll, I'll take your word for it that you got a thousand people around you. Um, this one is harps that I stood in the wind and just let the wind blow these again. Eh, am I going to be able to get anybody to, to do anything with this or if, if they are, I mean, uh, my guess is, is it's only going to be somebody that's publishing uh, new age type you know, meditational things. And I don't I don't look at this piece of art as being that. But maybe the only way I can get that album produced is if I change to what somebody else wants. And I don't want that. So in the case of if, if you have a book that um, you've combined unicorns and plumbing, you know, I, there's not much market for that. But if you believe in that. Right. You can go to that book publisher and say, I have a book about unicorns and, pl and plumbing, the adventures of unicorns and plumbing. And they're going to look at you and say, unless you really got a hook here, if we can't sell at least 10,000 copies of that, more like 100,000 copies of it, forget it. <clears throat> right. But that's some of the difference of where if you self-publish and you believe in that thing, it, if you're willing to say, no, I want this to happen, I'm willing to go out and push for it and let the audience decide essentially, then you can do that and you can bypass that publisher that says, I want to do a book about unicorns and plumbing or whatever. This is also why there's 750,000 titles self-published last year. And it's also why you could imagine that 
hundreds of thousands of those might never be read. Never be read. Or what? Or, or again. <laughs> but then again, the thing I've noticed, uh, one of my books was about investing in the stock market. Not unicorns and plumbing. Came out as the market crashed. But anyway, <laughs> I have a tendency to look at the industries as a, as a businessman. And the publishing industry has terrible record for being able to say, this is what people want. This is what's going to sell, and it sells. Uh, I'd like, I thank the Snow Isle researchers who found some data for me, and I'd like to get it updated. I got to remember to put in their request. <laughs> but it said that 20 of the authors in the industry accounted for half of the profits of the entire industry. What that says is that even within the traditional industry, the traditional publishers don't know what sells. But that's why they focus on those 20 authors. Not 20% of the authors, 20 authors. What that also says, though, is that we're no worse than they are. And in some ways, we're better. Because as he said, and as Amazon found out, it's that small niche market, an infinity of those small niche markets, that's as important as the mainstream market. So if, for instance, uh, I'll go back and I'll use the Mariners as an example. There are people who probably just, well, of course, there are fans of the Mariners, but there's got to be fans of the Mariners for one particular year. And maybe there's only 3,000 of them out of 300,000 fans, but there's 3,000 of them. If you manage to catch those folks with a book, they tell each other mm -hmm. about it. And you may get, instead of a 0.01% market capture, you may get 70% market capture. It's a very small market, but you may have just sold 2,000 books. That's what Amazon <coughs> was finding when they bought CreateSpace, was that it was these niche markets that the main publishers don't understand, that we do. Now, I don't understand all of your markets, and you're not going to understand my markets, and there's going to be some overlap, but... It makes it easier for us to kind of go, these are the people I know that care about this. And if I can contact that group, and that group frequently isn't 3,000, it's usually internationally 30,000 or 300,000, you can have a much stronger influence. Are there places that just do publicity, pub yes. publicists? Yes. Because I know that that's one of the perks that people think that conventional publishers yeah. do. You know, yeah. I mean, so, and you mentioned that you paid an extra thirty-five dollars for yeah. something. What yeah. was that I'm again? Rich. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, yeah. I mean, to get to get worldwide something or other. That was once. a contract with Ingram. I N G R A. Yeah, I know about Ingram. Okay. okay, so Ingram and Amazon have a deal or had a deal, yeah. and these things are continually shifting. Uh, Ingram and uh, Amazon had a deal where for thirty-five dollars, instead of just having Amazon distribution, we had I could get Ingram distribution. And that meant that Moonraker could have the book in their database. They wouldn't have to have it on the shelf. Somebody walks in and wants to buy it, wants to support a local book writer, a book uh, bookstore, and a book author. And they go into Moonraker, order the copy, get it delivered to Moonraker, and that thirty-five dollars enables that. Does it also get it on the internet so that it's in the search engine? And that's what I say. So it gets <laughs> gets it on the Amazon and gets it in the Ingram. As far as search engine optimization. Uh, that's not a can of worms, that's a 55 gallon barrel of, uh, of worms. Uh, but yes, once you're out there on Amazon, you're basically findable whether or not anyone will or not. But is there anyone that actually you can pay you can to hire, target your, your thing even more? It, it is probably the most needed part of self publishing yeah. that is least often hired out. Yeah, promotion is very difficult yeah because writing is inherently introvert <clears throat> and so yeah, that's is why extrovert. i'm asking whether there's other so there are people uh yeah. that uh that actually do that and uh, i'm not going to rattle off a bunch of names right now but if you send me an email or something like yeah, that I'm, I'm, yeah so we've, we have cards and bookmarks up there that have our contact information okay. um and if you uh pick up these ones very <coughs> cleverly this, uh, that's Tom's business card, but our, our, um, our uh, bookmark. 
it covers both, both of us. So yeah. grab grab one, it covers both. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about what software you use both to write and you know oh, the pros to. the mm -hmm. pros and cons of the most popular, easy to use ones. I yeah. Suppose. The reason I'm chuckling is because uh, I go as bare bones as possible. There's usually a program called Notepad or Text Edit or something like that. I do not use Word at all until I get to the very last step. Word it tries to outthink me, outsmart me so many different <laughs> times. They'll put in formats and special characters and things like that. I just use a regular text file, write in 80,000 words, and then when I think it's done, then I'll put it into Word, uh, usually as a template provided by the publisher, so that puts it in the right you know, margins and things like that. Um, and then I'll massage it in there uh, and then send it on up. So I use just text edit. And then for graphics, I use one of the free software tools on Google Drive, Google Docs. And I'll uh, generate everything up in that. There are times when that's not enough. And then I will go hire a photographer, not a, photographer a graphic designer, a book formatter, or a, uh, an editor, or a, a stylist, basically. Did I ask the question? Uh, well, this wasn't very specific. Okay. <laughs> so specifically, I, I use uh, Google Notes, Apple Text Edit. It was a notepad. I can't remember which. And then I use uh, Apple's Preview Program, which are, these are all things that come for free. And then I'll use Google Drive or Google Docs uh, Drawing Tool. I believe he uses a different set of tools. So when you, some of your books are photography books and Correct. some are more text oriented, do you use different tools for different? And that's why the photo book that was going to be done tonight is not done tonight. Because while many of these, most, almost all these publishers, what they'll have is you go up and you, they say, we'll help you publish and whatnot. And they'll have templates for the interior and for the exterior and for different types of books. Uh, Amazon gives you that. And covers, well, you do your own, but I do, my do own. you recommend you have? But let me, let me well, finish answering answer this and, one. And so what I do, so because of the level of quality I want to go with those photo books, um, I use their proprietary software. And that was what, so Blurb says, download the software, use it online. And unfortunately, uh, the five previous versions that I had done uh, were in an earlier version that's not forward compatible. Mm -hmm. So we had to start all over again. So you wouldn't use Blurb for a text heavy that really didn't I, have graphics. I have actually, but I don't. Work, there's not as much of a need for it. The uh, let me. Uh, this will be a little bit of a digression, but I'm also a photographer. Uh, one of the things that happened when I did my, my second book was folks said, "Well, we like what you wrote because it got an award. That's cool. Um, we'd like to buy the photos." I was like, "Okay, what do I do for that?" And uh, I started investigating at that point. So what I have found is that a full color book with, with a book with full color photos on the inside is ridiculously expensive. And this does get into that issue of how much it costs per book. Uh, it's not as great a difference in narratives, but it is on photos. So this is photo quality paper. This book, unit cost, the cost to me is $38. This is only like 50 pages, it's seven inches by seven inches. You can imagine how much more ridiculous it gets, the bigger it gets. If I go into Moonraker, the bookstore down the street, and try to sell this, and they've been nice enough to try, a mass marketed book that was traditionally published that wasn't nearly as local because these are all Whidbey Island books. But still, that book goes for $17. Basically, a third, their retail cost is a third of my total cost. I can't sell the book that way. But I'm a photographer, and I have studio tour, and I have gallery showings. And if I'm selling a book for $40 or $50, and it's sitting beside a $300 photo, this now looks affordable rather than looking unaffordable. This is what I said earlier about who you're going to sell it to, how you're going to sell it. Makes a difference. At least to me. Answer? Yes. Now you're saying. 
You were asking a question. I interrupted. Oh, yeah, so I can finish I'm answering sorry, hers. Uh, well, yeah. you were asking about. Uh, well, I know you program. made your own covers, but do you have like? Do you recommend uh, particular um, person one, that does one that I did, and I'm trying to bring up a graphic here. Uh, not that one. Ah, there we go. Um, when uh, when I got close to my hard drive crash, uh, when I thought I was going to uh, to get the book done there about two years ago. Um, I was crunched for time and trying to get photos, but also being on a budget, I wasn't able to get a graphic artist or go and do a photo shooting or something like that. Um, this is actually in uh, the backyard of a house I lived in about four, four miles from here in January. <laughs> um, and I just, between my dad and I, we were able to shoot these pictures and it got flipped, but you'd recognize that one. This is the picture that ended up getting used. I just ended up using a photo and went on uh, Fiverr, F I V E R R dot com, um, and uh, there were loads of people that are graphic artists that will do your book cover, do your ebook cover, do your promotional materials, do a package of those. So I actually had a fellow in Sri Lanka who was amazing. Um, in my case, I paid about twenty seven dollars, and I got um, the book, the matching ebook cover. Mm -hmm and those promotional materials, um, he was able to do it in a fairly short amount of time. And all I had was this picture, which in and of itself is, I mean, it's got action, which is great, but otherwise it's its kind of plain. But he was able to come up with a color design, some really bad at graphics. I can always conceive things that would have looked rad in the <laughs> 80s. But in, you know, now, now that we're modern people of the 1990s, that doesn't work. Um, but, uh, yeah, I went on Fiverr, under 30 bucks. And it took, I think it actually took a couple of weeks because the way this fellow worked was yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. if you wanted revisions, in his case, he was willing to do revisions until you were happy for that $27 amount. Some of the other, um, there was one author that I was talk talking to at the time. He was actually the one that gave me the idea of going on Fiverr. His book cover actually cost him $35 and it was because he had the initial draft and six revisions. But that person charged five dollars for the initial draft or any change. So I was also happy because I got this for twenty-seven dollars. I saved a bunch of money. Um, but it's it's the same way that I'm looking to do the the book cover of the one that I'm working Can on now. Can you use like if you have taken pictures of with your iPhone? Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's good enough quality. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, as a photographer, I know some friends of mine who are livid. At the idea that I would use anything under a one megapixel cam uh, photograph, but for that size, or a little bigger, yeah, you're doing fine. Uh, to as long as it's the, not a big blow up, it's not a big blow up. Now uh -huh. it is worth it to have the big blow up, if I may. There's a uh, one of my clients from last year went and spent. Uh, again, this is one that spent about eight thousand dollars getting the book formatted, edited, and the cover design. So basically about twenty five to three thousand twenty five hundred to three thousand mm -hmm. per. And uh, that was one where he really wanted that book to hit the bestseller list in New York Times. He wanted to have that door open in case that happened. In which case it behooves you to have a photo or an image that is high enough resolution so that if you're doing a book tour and you're going on Oprah or you're going on C SPAN or whatever you want to have something that is three foot by four foot without having to worry about it looking schlocky. Um, and now, to be honest, I don't worry about that. Um, I've done, uh, my camera isn't nearly as nice as his. <laughs> no, I just wanted to, you said yeah. the size of the picture, and I'm saying just a minute. Okay. DPI is very important. It is. Okay, so 150 <clears throat> DPI will let you go 16 by 24, virtually greenless. I've done. I've done a lot of. Was that a question or an answer? No, it was. A, it was. A, I was. I'm just not going to do the math while I'm standing. I'm worried right about that. you're saying. You know. Yeah. Something from this. Yeah. If you want to print it like this big. Oh no! I mean, I've taken uh, one megapixel photos. I know this is like I say. This is why an awful lot of photographers I know just don't like this. I'm taking one megapixel photos. I've blown them up to two foot by three foot, and folks will spend hundreds of dollars on them. Really? Yes, because they're not photographers. This is the other thing I found out about self-publishing writing as well. If you ask a writer 
about what it's like to produce a book this way. I find I get a different opinion than if I either ask a reader. <coughs> One of the books that's over there almost won an award, and it didn't Which because of uh, the, uh, the blue one on the right in the back. Blue one on the right? No, no, no. This, this one? <laughs> <laughs> to the right, to the right, to the right. Uh, 12 to the right, months. To the right, that one. Okay. Different rate. Sorry. Right. Ta -da. That came back from the editor saying they would have offered, they would have granted an award, except they didn't like my use of commas. I totally understand. I'm an engineer. I'm writing books. I may not get the punctuation right. I've yet, I've never had a reader come back and say, you know, I didn't like the way you used commas. <laughs> Readers care about story. They really care about content. They care about entertainment. Same thing with photography, I found. They care about whether or not it matches the sofa. They care about whether or not it reminds them of the place. Uh, you have to have really bad writing and really bad photography before they really go bad on it. But if I ask a photographer about a photograph, photograph I get a different response than if I ask a, an art patron. Same thing with writing. And that's the thing I found has been very liberating about the whole self-publishing change is that instead of having, as he said it earlier, instead of having to appease an agent and then an editor and then a marketer to get it published, you get the opportunity to say, I think a, write, I think a reader is going to like this. And it's at your risk. You may spend years writing a book and nobody else cares about it. But you get the chance to say that. You get the chance to try that. And to me, that that's the sort of thing that that's why I like doing these talks. That's why, I mean, I actually like doing this because I'm a fan of writers. <laughs> I really enjoy people and ideas, and this is one way folks can actually do that. And unfortunately, there's this image that it costs an awful lot of money, and it's really hard. And it's an awful lot of work. That's but it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> it's still a lot of work. It's still so, a lot of work. <laughs> um, I believe you've been waiting for a bit. Oh, just to add on the cover, um, I picked out for my two books uh, just a stock cover from, uh, in this case, Create Space. Mm -hmm. They had about a dozen or maybe two dozen. Yeah. And I like it a lot. It's just real yeah. simple, clean, and easy. And you can pick out the colors that you want on the on the front, and um, done. And and I didn't spend a dime on either one of my books. So if I may, at this point, right. let me step through the pieces of the book. Sure. Yeah. Oh, we talked about that earlier. Switch on the cable. Um, now, I'll just... Can I ask you one question for you? Yeah. You're going to backtrack a little bit. We were talking about, we about four-color prints inside a book. How about simple black and white blind blocks? Oh, yeah. Is that yeah. Um, eminently mm -hmm. expensive? Or? No. no. As a no. matter of fact... Um, um, I actually have step-by-step -step photos of... Yeah, photos. There you go. Just, even still, if it's a graphic... It's just a graphic. Simple... And yeah, and, and there's the thing, whether whether I had a scan of a pen and ink or if I had my I photo. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the same. But if you you can now get color in your like because this is Amazon, um, you can get color in there, but it, it cuts out but, of your but yeah, I mean yeah, there's something like that. Yeah. And that's doesn't cost a lot more to put it in or that's a great lead into the question I want to answer after I answer this other okay. question. <laughs> <laughs> because it gets so th there's, there's two things that uh, I, I always want to make sure I go over in one of these talks, and sometimes I'll even step on my copers that are in the meantime. Step is okay. Kick, no. No, no, no. Yeah, trigger. But <laughs> one is, uh, it's the, the pieces of the book. What's actually the book? The There's really four things. I mean, we frequently think about the book being what you wrote or the photos that are going to go into it. But it's not just the the words, it's how do you want those laid out? After you've gotten it written, do you want, what do you want in the header? What do you want in the footer? Do you want chapter headings? Do you not want to have chapter headings? Do you want photos before the chapters? Do you want page numbers? Do you want table cut? All those things, open any book that you like that looks like what you want it yours to look like, and no, pay attention to the words. Pay attention to the way they're laid out. Is there underline? Is there italicized? What kind of font did they use? All those sort of things you get to decide, I and mean, you have to decide. It's like building a brand new house. If you move into a house that's already been built, you know, you've got that faucet, you got that faucet. If you're building a brand new house, you have to figure is it going to be silver or bronze or porcelain or whatever. 
and also the size of the book. If you don't have many words, you make it smaller so you get enough of a spine so that the spine shows a title. And then also whether or not you want to have color on the inside, because that's a major cost driver. That's the sort of thing that takes one of my seven by seven inch books and turns it into a fifty or forty-five dollar um, fiasco in some regards. The as, graphics. As a side note, you can also then use that as something depending on what it is. If you need color in your book, you need color in your book. Yeah. If you don't need color in your book, well, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, I don't need color in my book, but at the same time, um, then I can turn that into a marketing thing where I can go to people and say, "Hey, did you get my book? Okay, great. Um, do you want to see color?" pictures of my book okay go on my website right and then i'm driving people to my website and it's also the reason if color really enhances it it's one of the things that ebooks give you the opportunity to do right without any extra cost the uh, the number of graphics that you put in is an issue in that depending on the publisher you're using and they're really printers they call themselves publishers that's another nuance for the long I've done this uh, talk, by the way, as a two-day session. So if you feel like I'm glossing over things, it's because I'm glossing over things. Um, but it gets into how fancy you want the paper, what's the resolution you want to have, and whether or not they have a limit to how many photos, how many graphics you can put in there. Some do, some don't. And that's the sort of thing to, to look at. This we, demand print won't work with photo books, will it? Say what? The demand print to demand? Or yeah, these, these are all print on demand. Okay, so a print on demand with a photo book? Yeah. In color. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Does it, how do you, how do you know, like say what kind of paper to use? Because I noticed your paper is really nice. Uh, and some that, of that is the, that is the moderate quality version for that book. Just so you know, they have higher quality paper now. Um, anything that I've seen that I thought was going to be a hindrance within five years has always turned out to be something that somebody's incorporated. C-Y-M-K? Uh, B-L-U-R-B dot com. <laughs> no, you know what I mean. I know what you mean. R -G I have no idea. R-G-B or C-Y-M-K because I've already I, gone this route well, to the point. And, and I encourage you to go do the research and find out. Yeah. Well, I because this is self-publishing. They insisted on C-Y-M-K, so I had to take everything I did in R-G-B and translate. You know, transfer. I understand. But this is going to be very prohibitive for me because this is not going to get it. It's going to have to be at least this big. And they're not the only ones doing it, and okay. that's the thing. Is so, uh, so we'll get to that here in a bit. And then the two other things that are, like I said, there's four things to the book that aren't just the the words. There's the text, the graphics. We already talked about the cover art, and as he was pointing it out, it's not just the photo. It's the photo. It's the title. It's the subtitle. It's the words. It's also what goes on the front, what goes on the back, what goes on the spine. All those things end up having to be things that you have to decide. It is a lot more work than, I, I devote a long time to figuring out what the title is gonna be. Um, he was nice enough to, let's see. These books, there's a series of three, 12 months at various lakes up in the Cascades have received some marvelous critical feedback. Hardly ever sell. Can you read the title? Mm -hmm. Oh, can you yeah. read that part too? No, you can, very really legible. It is, there's no verb in the title. There's nothing to say whether or not this is something that's a naturalist. Is this from a developer? Or is this from somebody who lives there? There is so much ambiguity that there's nothing that draws people in. Walking, thinking, drinking across Scotland, even though you have a rough time reading it because it's white, it's got the right words in the title. Words, titles benefit from having search words in the title. So he's got food. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I we actually had to tweak this because I had a couple of different titles going before this, but where I have search terms is actually in the subtitle, which is cookies, biscotti, coffee, comfort food. And I mean, those are my power players, but in my actual title, make your own darn good cookies. It's got a good emotional registration, but as a title goes for search terms, it's worthless, <laughs> but and, it's fun. And the other thing is 
when you realize most folks, when they're looking at a book, especially if it's online, they're looking at an icon. They're not looking at a cover. They're looking at something that may only be that big. So darn good cookie stands out. That's the sort of thing, that's no longer a book cover, that's an icon. You want to make the book cover something that is clickable, even in the real world. So, something that people look at and say, I want to know more because it's visually attractive enough because people do judge books by their cover. Uh, thank you so much. You're now, welcome. There, the, this is a stat that's a few years old. Again, I doubt that it's changed, though. 95% of all book sales come off the cover. 3% come off the back cover, and that's usually inside of 90 seconds. The remaining 1.5% come off the interior, and that's usually the first page, maybe, no, that's usually, yeah, that's usually the first page, because the last half of a percent are folks who will actually read into the book past the first few paragraphs to find out what you actually wrote. Book covers sell books initially. Book covers do not make bestsellers. Because what makes a bestseller is somebody who actually read the book, got to the end of it and said, you five people should go buy a copy of this book. So what you write really does matter, but the initial sales come off the cover. Don, do you have bake in your title? Uh, once, upon, once, upon, <laughs> once upon a time. <laughs> yeah, well, once upon a time, it was uh, it was make, um, but this has, it's like the first three chapters are cookies, and then I have uh, beverages, a few other things, and then the fifth chapter is mm -hmm. main courses, hence comfort food. So yeah, it was bake your own darn good cookies for a long time there, and then I said, wait a minute, that's it doesn't jive with the rest of the book, mm -hmm. because it's not just cookies. So, can I talk about publishers? Please. Okay. So those are the four part, four parts of the book. Pardon me. The trick is when you're going to self-publish is figuring out who you're going to work with. Oh shoot! <laughs> Sorry about that. She kept going with that Gretchen and I did. Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> that, was, that was good. Enough. I was say quick. during the opening, set your cell phones to stun. <laughs> Just like there are four major parts to a book, it's easy to just kind of break up the publishers into things, the four different sets of criteria. All these companies, this is still a maturing uh, industry. The reason I haven't produced another book about it is because it keeps changing. So, And it's an industry that's almost old enough to drink. This is true. <laughs> the first main category, well, is the book, the cost, the rights, and distribution. The book is some of the things we've already talked about, but it's the size, whether it's hardcover, whether or not you want an ebook, um, how many graphics are going to go inside, whether they're color or black and white, and what quality you want to have on those, and switch glasses, Tom, and whether or not they can do some of the things that you, <laughs> no, this works better, uh, whether or not they can do some of the things that you can't. Again, there's that long list of things that is required to get a book out, and if you can't do those and they can and you, you like the price, then that's a reason to pick that publisher. And then there's also limitations. Frequently, they don't want to go too small. They don't want to go too large. Simple enough, that big machine that's making those things, the glue can only hold so many pages. Spines can only be a certain size. You have to check. As a matter of fact, for instance, one of my clients uh, uh, sells in France. In, and books are written in French. And I've got, of all things, a book formatting credit in French. But um, there's a particular format that is a standard in France that's not standard here. So we use a different publisher because of that. The second main thing is the costs. And that is what's up front and what's the cost in the long run. Are you gonna pay more up front to take your long running costs down, your non-recurring costs, or your recurring costs down? There's that balancing act. Whether or not they're gonna give you higher royalties or no, uh, that is strongly also dependent on what, whether or not you have the opportunity to pick the price. There are some publishers that say, hey, we're just going to tell you what it costs. It's up to you to put a price tag on it. And there are going to be other publishers that say, we're putting some of our effort into this. We're going to tell you if that's 137 or 138 pages, how much that's going to cost. You said you, that you, you were, the publishers were actually printers. But what you're talking about now is, 
is not just some some printer that you hire <clears throat> to do the printing. I mean, you're talking about there's a spectrum. Okay. And there are some that will look to do everything for you, and there are some that were only going to do one thing for you, and that's one of the things you get to pick. And you and you can give us some names. Right? I can give you some websites. There are people that follow this industry the way other people follow baseball, where you can go to baseball sites and you can find out all the stats and all the players. Yeah. There are people that put together spreadsheets online of all the criteria and all the yeah. publishers, and I gave up. <laughs> but these would be self-publishing publishers. Correct. And the reason I hesitate, and, and there's a... I mean, there's, there's obviously a debate. Amazon and Create, uh, there's those. There, there's a debate as to when do you go from calling them a printer to calling them In, a publisher. Ingram's firm, good marketing, essentially. Uh, distribution. Well, and, <laughs> and just to show you another thing that's changed within the last six months, or, well, within the last year, Ingram has watched what Amazon did with buying Create Space and said, hey, we're watching Amazon make money off of print-on-demand titles. Why aren't we doing that ourselves? We're the distributor. Oh, book baby. No, so they came up with Ingram Spark, and they have their own thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Ingram oh yeah. Spark. Yeah. The the third main item can seem trivial, but can also be lucrative or important or whatever is rights and exclusivity. If you publish with that publisher slash printer or whatever, who has what rights? When I publish with Create Space, I pretty much have all the rights to it. The uh, one of these books that I did through our universe 10 12 years ago, I don't have the copyright necessarily on this book, they have right of first use, and there's probably a better uh, uh, term for it. But they considered that this is their book that I have provided copyrighted material for. So that I can't just take this content and go put it onto a different publisher. Whereas with Great Space, I can't. The other thing that that really gets into is if anybody is writing anything that has a narrative, like a plot or a story, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, but it's easiest to imagine this with a novel. If you are writing a novel, you have the potential to be writing a screenplay. If you write that and you publish it with somebody, who owns the movie rights? This is a silly thing. Who cares about the movie rights? <laughs> Except for the fact that one of the most expensive houses on the island was from an author who happened to end up with a TV series. So that's important as to who has the movie rights, who has the rights. Well, and there's a... Uh, if it's a cookbook, it's not as much of an issue. Yeah, there's <laughs> there's not much action in there. Yeah. Um, there's a uh, podcaster. I wanted to hope, hope to find a spot to plug this in. There's a podcaster by the name of Joanna Penn, P-E-N-N. -E -N. Um, she now has, I think, 422 episodes. Um, fabulous material. I, I, I started listening to it and I've downloaded everything and I'm just nuts about listening to this because I just see the titles and there's so many things that address what I'm interested in doing, whether it's sci-fi cookbooks, marketing, children's books, what have you. Um, one of the things that uh, was covered in, in one of the podcasts that I did listen to was film rights. And the big takeaway that I had there was this fellow turned around and said, if you are writing fiction, the big money is not in the book. The big money is in the, is in the film rights. And if you sell the film rights, you've got that. The, the, the money is yours. He says, if the film doesn't ever get made, you need to disconnect from that because most don't. Right. But if you want to make money, sell film rights. Yeah. That's where the money's at. There's an entire industry based on that. Right. And we want to get back to that before the end, too. The last thing I want to mention on this is the fourth thing with the publisher is whether or not they're going to help with distribution, advertising, and of all things, returns. One of the downfalls of print-on-demand and self-publishing that hasn't really changed much, it's changed somewhat, but it hasn't changed much, is returns. If you go to a bookstore and you buy a book and you open it up and there's a squashed bug in the middle of it, and it was out of Prentice Hall or whoever, you, know, you can take it back to them and say, I want a different book. With a self-published book, bookstores frequently don't want to take books from self-published authors because if they do that with a major <coughs> distributor, that's great because they can always just they get a bunch of books and they send a bunch of books back. 
But if they have 200 authors that they're working with, that's 200 separate negotiations, and they don't want to do that. We're lucky on Whidbey that the bookstores here actually carry books from local authors. Some would say to, to their detriment, to the bookstore's detriment, because they're not making money on all those books. It's a very gracious thing that they're doing. But that's one of the other things, is some of these publishers have found ways to make book returns more tenable. It depends on whether or not that's an important thing to you. Uh, because of that, that's one of the reasons why I stress online sales for my books. Because that's... If I have a book and I put it into a bookstore and somebody puts a label on the back of it, it's now a used book. If they put a label on the back of it, somebody got out and they bent it a little bit, it's now a used book. Uh, I just have damaged merchandise. And I can't return it. It comes back to me. Anyway, so those are the four main, so there's four main things to the book. There's four main things to uh, the, the publisher that you pick. And like I say, this is, I can make this all available. It is all available online, but it's not harder to find until I actually, you know, get an email from you and send it to you. Um, I, and that pretty much covers those two elements that uh, thank you for giving me the time to do. So then there's just like Ingram Spark would, would just be like you could use them for distributing. Ingram and Spark. And all no, that. Ingram Spark is actually their printer. Oh. They actually produce paperback and hardback books. And they're a brand new service out of Ingram. Mm. Uh, one of my clients used them last year and they were really impressed with the product. I heard they're better than the. Um, have, have you ever heard the. There's a term which is uh, powerful or user friendly? Mm -hmm. You can't be both. Create Space is user friendly, Ingram Spark is powerful. <laughs> So, for instance, when CreateSpace says, give us a PDF file, a file that, you know, uh, is fairly general, okay, fine, give them a PDF. Ingram Spark was asking for something like a, a PDF slash X10.5. They wouldn't take any other version except that. So, yes, they do a much better job, but it took us weeks just to figure out what file format they wanted. But then again, they produced an awesome hardcover book that Create Space couldn't do. And for that client, that was important. For that author, that was important. And it's, it's actually uh, that's a, that's a good book. He just decided not to sell it. But aside from that, it's available on Amazon, and he never goes out there and tries to distribute it or try, tries to sell it. So it just sits there. And I think there's uh, one of the things that happened here, too, within the last six to 12 months is that there, there was, correct me if I'm wrong, um, there was a bit of a division between Amazon and Ingram because oh, yeah. when, when <laughs> I was in this workshop six years ago, you said when you're uploading your book, when it comes and says, do you want Ingram? Click yes, pay the money because they will push that through world markets. And at this point, if you're using Amazon and you're uploading your book and this is who I am, this is my bank information, whatever, there is no Ingram there. And I ran into this when, when I was getting my book uploaded and I called Tom and went, there's no Ingram there. Yeah. Um, my understanding is, is Amazon has essentially come up with their own process or companies in the background yeah. that is like Ingram. So if you're looking for Ingram and you're uploading to Amazon and it's not there, that's why, because now they're competitors. And that was the thing I wasn't sure is how that's going to develop, whether that's going to be a permanent or a temporary schism. Well, I'm hoping temporary because I'm also hoping that I can still somehow get my Amazon-made <laughs> book pushed by Ingram because they're viral. Yeah. So. And, and this all does all change all the time. Uh, that's why, you know, uh, it's regularly coming back to this. Even if you've already self-published a book, it's worth going back and doing some more research on it because it changes every few months. The, the business models are so immature at this point that the companies are still trying to figure out, are they making money? with the author by having published a book that they get a cut of every time it sells? Or are they making money from the author by charging the author $3,000 to design a cover? One could argue that it's easier to make money from the author than from the sales. And yeah. I don't think they've actually figured out exactly for themselves which way it works best here. Yeah, I looked into hybrid, what they call hybrid publishing. Oh, yeah. you know about that? No, I don't. There's one called Balboa Press. Oh, okay, no, Balboa, I know. Yeah, yeah but the, a lot of them are scams. Yeah. I mean, the thing is you have to put money up front, and then they do a lot of the work. 
for you, and then they give you a higher cut than a regular publish, a yeah. regular conventional publisher would do, but not as good as if you self-publish by yourself. But there's, um, and and there are now reg conventional publishers that are developing hybrid wings because because people are getting less interested in having conventional yeah. publishing. Create but, space used but, to only do the, the do the free version effectively, and now they're offering all these. Yeah, other but programs. the hybrids. There's a lot of a yeah. lot of um, uh, co you know sort of corruption that's happening in a lot of them. So it's just something to be yeah. aware of. Because I I signed up with this Balboa, and I had I had about um, ninety days or something, you know, at, before I I would lose money, uh, hmm. and. Uh, a friend of mine on Facebook said, you know, did you really look at their reviews? And then the more I looked, first of all, they said they were a, a, a part of Hay House. Oh. And and then, in fact, when you call up Hay House, the they say, Bravo is not connected to us. And things like that. So, you know. <laughs> it, it, it is, it is yeah. a, an industry that yeah. uh, does go back to that vanity press thing where vanity, yeah. uh, they take advantage of folks that are convinced that their story is the great American novel and they're going to spend ten thousand dollars on it, even if they could get by with a thousand, because they well, appeal because to they them. think this these people are going to do this work for them. And some of them do, but they have their money, they have your money too, so they don't necessarily so follow up that well. So, as much as, as that's a, a possible downer, uh, oh, let me go through this part real quick. Remember, I said half the profits go to 20 of the authors. Uh, and one recent year, I think it was 2017, um, I couldn't find a whole lot of data, but one data point I found was there were only 265 books that sold more than 100,000 copies. Now, arguably, if you sell 100,000 copies of your book, congratulations, you just made a, a bunch of money. Traditionally, that was usually like a dollar or two a book. But what that tells you is that 265 people, it seems like it would be more than that out of... 300 or 750,000 titles. There's very few folks that actually make an awful lot of money on the book sales. The majority, uh, I'll take it back. Many authors make money not from the book sales, but from when the book enables. By doing, by having written a book, you end up with a credential. And it may be that you can sell excerpts from the book. Uh, you can then be considered an expert in fitness and uh, how zookeepers can relay information about how we should all be in fit, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, it opens up all these other uh, avenues. So for instance, I now have a gig, I'm, put it this way, I'm a real estate broker, partly because I got hired to write about real estate, partly because I wrote a book about personal finance and had been going into foreclosure, so I understood how we could write into that. Partly because I'd written four other books prior to that, and like I said earlier, that it all started by accident, just because I wrote an awful lot of emails. It's not those books that have benefited me the most financially. It has been teaching, speaking, writing for other paid outlets that have nothing to do with that first book. Even some of the blog posts that you do, you get paid for. Yeah, I'm now getting paid $150 per blog post for this one particular client. Fine. It's 800 words, 150, uh, 150 bucks, and they like what I do. And they just asked me to double my production rate. <laughs> that 150 books, uh, 150 dollars, is dozens of book sales that I would have to make to equal that. Well, and it's also potentially dozen, dozens of book sales because of people that read that blog post and go, "Hey, this Tom Trimbath fellow, I like the way he writes. What else do you do?" Or, for instance, I put out a book on photos, and I sell the photo book at a at zero profit, and somebody buys a photo that's worth 320 bucks. Okay, I just printed a brochure. I just printed a catalog. Okay, fine. Uh, that and, someone else paid for. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then the irony of this whole thing is that it can come right back again, because now the traditional publishers are looking at self-published authors and looking at their success rates to decide whether or not they want to traditionally pick them up. Mm -hmm. Because one of the reasons they had the editors and all those gatekeepers in the past was to make sure that their business risk went down. 
They wanted to make sure it was a good product so that it would sell. If you write a book and you sold that book and it's still doing well a year later, they don't have to guess. They know how you're going to write. They know what kind of thing you're going to produce. They know how you're going to sell it. They know whether or not you're on blog. They know whether or not you're doing social media. They know whether or not you do talks. They know all that now. So that makes you a proven person. And uh, that's one avenue I haven't gone back to to investigate further because I'm busy enough as it is. But I also recognize that that's another avenue. So it isn't the book itself. It's where the book leads. That's as important as anything. Is there an advantage to be picked up by a, by a conventional publisher? I mean, people always contract. say, I got picked up by such and such, you know? To some folks, that is really important. Uh -huh. uh, but financially, just, you don't get as much then. Mm. Well, again, how good is their contract? Yeah. yeah well, what are they true. offering? Uh, yeah. I was talking to an author yeah. who uh, typically sells 100,000 copies of her book. Uh, she writes a book a year. And mm -hmm. uh, she goes on speaking tours now. She does the book tour thing out of her own pocket. And then the publisher decides afterwards from the receipts what they're going to reimburse. Mm -hmm. So there's somebody who's doing that well, and they're putting all the risk on her. Mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if I was going to get that opportunity, I would be in much more of a negotiable mood. What is you really going to yeah, give me? Yeah, yeah. So. Anyway, I have talked uh, a lot. I don't think I've given Don as much time to talk, but we're running out of time to talk as well. Anything else you want to say then before you just really open it up? Um, well, one of the things that we touched on a little bit earlier, and part of the reason why I brought up Book Baby here, um, when it comes to these different companies and uploading your book to their websites, they'll want different things. Um, I ended up, you talked about using Word for, or Notepad for yeah. writing your book. I used Word just, I'm, big typer and use word all the time um what uh at least again amazon um what they have when you establish your profile with them as uh upcoming upcoming new author if it's your first book or or at least upcoming new author or upcoming author with them one of the things they offer is templates on their website and i and and you get those uh much like these where it's you know, which size that you want or I think to a certain extent they'll do a, a custom size, but they cut <laughs> they cut out of the profits for that. Uh, um, but the templates that they offered, the way they were already set up with their pagination, their their page numbers, how the chapter opened, I just didn't like how that looked. And I'm not that good at at those those parts of changes within uh, within Word because not all of them are as intuitive as Microsoft programmers think they think they are. <laughs> And that's on video. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I ended up looking around a bit too, and what I found that I was really happy with, and it's, it, you know, it's the only reason why I'm, it's the only reason why I'm plugging them. But I will take endorsement deals. Um, <laughs> Book Baby, um, they ended up, uh, they give every size. You can download every size in Word, and um, they they just don't have as much goop inside the Word document. So it's you. You can you can handle your formatting a little bit better um, when it does come up to uploading your book ultimately. And, and for the example with Amazon, what was interesting there is when I uploaded my book. I think you could do it in Word, but it was your suggestion to do it as a PDF because a PDF, so to speak, stabilizes your pages more once you upload it. It's also nice because it's a much smaller file size, particularly when you have a bunch of pictures of cookies and stuff in there because that jacks up the size of your book but when it came to uploading my ebook with basically the same file it was just it was uh, a few index pages shorter but it's it's basically the same book i couldn't upload that as a pdf it wasn't an option i could only upload that as a word document and what was really nuts was i was doing that at home and my internet connection is hot spot it's not <laughs> it's not high speed internet so i'm sitting there for 15 minutes just like tickling my computer <laughs> trying to keep this Word document uploading before it just says no, right? And you even talked about that before of, of early days of uh, POD of uploading via uh, dial-up 56K BOD. No, no. No, 14.4, no, no. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure it was after 28, Okay, but uh, a day and a half. It took me a day and a half to upload this the first time, and you 2002. And you didn't get any phone calls. No, 
I didn't have a happy wife. <laughs> but for I'm me, not making comments on your social life. Anymore, so. <laughs> I don't know what's happening in her life anymore. Yeah, well, but uh, both the best. But um, uh, and things have changed that dramatically. Um, if you can't tell, and I've mentioned it before, uh, there's a lot to go over. We've just kind of gross, grossly touched on a lot of the different aspects. And like I say, in the past, I've done this as a two-day event uh, where it's actually a workshop where people actually get to work on their books. Um, and there's everything in between. We've talked about uh, taking this on the road. So if you know a bunch of folks that want to uh, have somebody come in and talk about this, we can come in and talk. Um, if you want to actually work on it, then that's more time and a uh, higher price according. And um, something else that we've talked about is development, taking this as to being a day or a weekend long workshop uh, here on the island, off the island. We're also talking about podcasting. So one of the things that we do also have here is an email sign up sheet. So if you want us to, uh, if you want us to e-stalk you later and let you know about what we're doing. And the thing up. that made this all happen, by the way, tonight is the Friends of Langley Library. Is that the right name? Do they accept donations? They sure do. do they accept money? Sure do. What a concept. <laughs> and aren't they the, the people that collect up and sell the books yeah. in the back? Uh, that's one of the sweetest things about being on Whitby is there are so many writers here. There's so much talent. Uh, there's a Facebook group, which is Whitby Authors, and that's a great place to kind of share stuff back and forth. Um, many of us have, are in mourning still over what happened to the Whitby Islands Writers Association. But what we're watching happen now is very sporadic little grassroots things that are becoming not so little anymore. And they're starting to reform uh, totally organically. So who knows what's going to happen with it? But uh, if, you, if you have questions, and we don't have the answers, we, we don't know everything, it's amazing the response that's available on this island. And uh, whether it's reaching out through Facebook, um, other versions of social media, uh, or just go hanging out at the coffee shops and walking around and seeing what's on everyone's laptop, you know, there's a bunch of other writers out there to work with. And, and boy, I tell you, it's just, I'm humbled whenever I work with all these folks or see what everybody else is doing. Do you have to have a hard copy book before you can create an ebook? Nope. Can, no. So you don't way, even have to do it. For me, the best way to go would be to create an ebook. Yep. Yeah. And uh, the other thing, and by the way, the reason they he mentioned that they won't take a PDF as ebook is because if you're a control freak, ebooks will drive you nuts. <laughs> Paper, I know that that page number is going to go right there, and I know that text is going to be right there, and it's going to end on that period. In the ebook, you don't know how big the font is going to be, whether it's a white background or a black background. You don't know how big their reader is. Everything is dynamic. So you have to give up control. And that is something that some folks can't do. On the other hand, you put together an ebook, it goes up so fast, and they can go viral much more readily than paperbacks can. I have five times more sales on ebooks than I do on my paperbacks. And but you probably, can't control the formatting at all on an ebook? No. Well, you can kind of force it, though. What I do is I do an awful lot of page breaks, and I'll put in a photo. So one photo will be one page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that kind of fixes that. Yeah, and your profit, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> your profit margin is also higher on ebooks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, and you, you don't know, have to write returns. Yeah, and Amazon. Yeah, yeah, for uh, sure. Amazon <laughs> is like they get get it for the ebook and I'm selling mine for five dollars and fifteen cents. So <laughs> great. That's a, a, a eighty percent profit margin there. That's much right, better. But than if what you I'm want a certain um, but what about copying your ebook? Someone copying your ebook can you do that? The digital rights management has been uh, worked incredibly incredibly hard to the point that it got to be hard for folks who bought it to be able to read it. Um, arguably, anything can be hacked. Anything can be copied. I'm not going to be one of these folks that says you can make it totally locked down. Mm -hmm. But it is nicely balanced, in my, in my opinion. It's nicely balanced between user-friendly and powerful at this point. Well, at this point, it is 8 o'clock. So if you want to hang around and talk, great. If you've been waiting to get out of here because you were done a half an hour ago, but you didn't want to walk out in front of everybody, now is your opportunity. <laughs> but I'm going to be here around. I'm sure Don's going to be around. If you want books, and, somebody has books. And uh, <laughs> grab uh, business cards, bookmarks, and uh, both of us are active on Facebook and LinkedIn. Well, Facebook and Twitter. LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, that's, like I say, 
The thing that's great about having a the conversation there is that everybody else gets to join in if you want them to. And you can ask me a question, I can say one thing, and you'll get five people going, no, it's not that way at all. <laughs> so. so if we email you, we can get like more five specific. specific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is that Oh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, 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 Instagram. But yeah, it's, it's, there, it's um, really more uh, photo oriented. You know, I was actually talking about the film Bob Conrad. How many folks are doing this? Do you have some of those Bob Conrad's or nothing to do with Instagram? It's on the B-Runs now. That's actually one channel 30. Whatever it's one old focus on Twitter or huh? Facebook or something. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I, I, I did a lot of photo work for the, I'm to get the pilots started, of the program, you know, including photos with Patty Boyne and everything. So, and they had a in Coeur d'Alene, there was a, in their airport there. They renamed it the Patty Boyne team. They're all the most basic needs of gigs. And the guy that went through all that, like, I used to get that done. I met him at the Scottish Small Town for 10 minutes for five bucks. That's not great. So, in the case of my cover, I showed him the photo. The guy offered a couple of Wow, I really like to get those. To five dollars. So, he gives me this release. He gives him my copy. I said, no way. He offered a lot of for this little I saw him my work. I'm not going to say that. I don't want to see a one time time to write, you know, to show it at your place. I could find somebody who was going to scan it. Yeah. And I did. I went through that whole thing and then I said, I called him up. I have some things. I don't accept this. Give me my copy. I'll give you a one-time copyright to display. That's it. And if you want, I'll give it to you digitally. You can put it up on the monitor where it runs to you all the time. If you want. I didn't know. Exactly right. I was going to get them for free. You know, give it to everybody. I had your free gift, but I needed to do it. And that's actually a great team. And that's actually a great team. And that's Yes, I know. I recognize the camera. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of a first of all, you're walking around with this guy. Okay, I recognize the fact that you're walking around with a bigger camera. <laughs> this, this is really heavy. Um, and what ended up happening I mean, I mean, oh, and that was the thing. I mean, like, yeah, thirty dollars worth of work off between these two parties. I actually put it in a That's a tight book cover. But so the thing that I was if you go to is, yeah, I mean, the thing is, is like. So I I just plugged in what I was looking for, so maybe like Instagram. 